Welcome, everybody. Hope you had a great lunch. Always tricky to get people into discussing domain driven design and Microsoft after a heavy lunch, I suppose. It's n there's going to be a very little code, so don't worry. Um, I want to start off saying I have, an, an, have an admission to make. This is not a new talk. It's actually three years old now. I did it in this very spot three years ago at Java Zone. In Norwegian, so it is the first time I attempt in, in English. But I see this as a redux. Because it's not, it's not exactly the same talk. I've updated it, of course, because a lot of things have happened since uh, 2016, especially in this crazy Microsoft's world. So, um, and I hear a lot of people talking about Microsoft now and also saying and seeing that um, maybe things didn't pan out necessarily how, to, how we expected it. I'm not saying that I was, that I was uh, clairvoyant back then, but I saw some issues that could happen. So it, that, does mean, that means that it's quite interesting to, to go back to these slides and see are they still relevant. And they are surprisingly never still relevant. Um, and the thing is that Microsoft, as we know, kind of lack this formal definition. I find that a bit worrying. I mean, people talk about, like Newman here, he's talked about business uh, um, domains. Somebody talks about loose and Yudi Dahan talks about um, uh, business capabilities, and uh, I think Cockcroft mentions bound and context. And that comes, that's a central part of domain driven science. So I wonder how much understanding of how people are having of this, because all these concepts are quite vague, right? And uh, we can easily then end up saying micro with number of lines. So, so I, want, I want to dig into that domain driven design part of this then. And I'm not the only one who says that domain driven design is necessary. This is uh, Nick Tune from the MuCon in London just recently. I love that slide. I, I suspect he put it in because he liked the image. But and I also heard somebody told me that Sam Newman did something similar earlier yesterday or something. He talked about that you need domain driven design to get this going. So let's see what this can help us. How this can help us. Anyone seen this? I believe I saw this first time in about 2016, no, tw yeah, 2016 when I did the talk. This was a common thing. It was Microsoft's this, Microsoft's that, and Microsoft's everywhere. And people got really fed up, especially those architects at the higher level, like the ivory type architects. They love to send those mails around with those. But Microsoft is here, are probably not here to stay, it seems like. It wasn't a hype. Um, and it has become sort of the, the default way of doing modularization. So I want to say, firstly, that this is definitely not a pick on Mac services at all. I love services. They have, to me, they're like uh, sliced bread. I really like them. I all like services. But I've been in service orientation for many years. So Mac services for me, is not really something new. At least that's how I interpret it. So that could be, be my bias into it. That somebody see Microsoft as something completely different than I do, but I, I try to build on um, existing uh, definitions that came way before Microservices. And the cool thing about the so see Microsoft is that it seems like it is a, more of a grassroots movement. It comes from the teams and the developers. Like, as I remember so far, that was heavily vendor driven. Like the old big ESPs, for those of you who remember those. And it doesn't seem to have gotten there yet with Microservices. But it might, so let's be careful. So, anyone seen this slide before? It was just a few months I picked up this. The so-called Death Star, Microsoft's Death Star. This is some, we could end up there if we're not careful. I'm not saying that this is Uber, I think. Uber, Uber sorry, Uber, I think. I'm not saying that they have problems with their Microsoft's, uh, but when you have thousands, it got to be tricky and hard. And uh, I noticed somebody on Twitter noticed this. I'm going to zoom in. Be that service, not the rest. So let's see if we can get there with little or no uh, any, uh, interactions with others. And my strong belief is that you should have, before you start on this journey, because it is a journey to go from, say, if you've got a monolith and you want to move into microservices, it is a journey, and you never start a journey without some sort of guide, like a map, or not necessarily a plan, because plans are tricky, don't use those necessarily, but you have to have an idea where you're going and what you're doing. And it seems like maybe people are not. This more seems like more like a mob culture, if you like, just people hacking away. So, have a strategy. 
So let's try to see what microservices are. I see them as a spectrum. They are at the end of the spectrum that starts with a monolith at one end, the big chunk, big huge thing, and you've got microservices on the other end. And for me, that's a false dichotomy. I don't think it is black or white. It's not either or. There are lots of, of nuances in between here. And I've been familiar, at least, with. Uh, let, let's do the sorry. Let's do the, the uh, characteristic first. Large, as I said, is often have high coupling. A lot of stuff in the same place. They all couple together. And there's low cohesion, meaning that there's a lot of stuff together that doesn't necessarily logically live together. They just are put together by accident or just by design because we want a big monolith. On the other end, we want something small, micro. We want low coupling between these things, ideally and high cohesion. Each component should be drilled to do one thing and one thing well. But in between these two extremes, you got the model monolith. That's um, like Simon Brown talks a lot about. Why, why can't you start with a well-defined modulized monolith instead of running all the way to microservices? Could it be a stepping stone at least? Or maybe you could be happy with a model monolith? Maybe that will help you? Or you could do something like so what 2.0. I'm not sure that term is established. There was something Gartner attempted to call it. It's like uh, after the SOA, classical ESB SOA, somebody tried to say that, OK, we want components that send events between them. Let's call that something else. Bah, SOA 2.0. So this is, for those of you who are familiar with Judith Ahan, and probably many of you are, since this is a .NET conference, um, and Service Bus, uh, this event-driven thing. So yeah, all right. But modularization, let's get back to the, um, I'm an old fart, I'll at least become one now. So let's go back and see, have we done this before? Anybody recognize this quote? It's not a quote, so yeah. I can help you a little by adding that. Any clues, anyone? I would be surprised if anybody did, but this is from David Panas from now in 1972. If you replace modularization there with microservices, of stuff, for example, doesn't that sound very familiar? Isn't that what we're doing? And in this paper, which is actually this, this is a front page of it, I highlighted that line there. It says that the effectiveness of uh, modularization, well, modularization is dependent upon the criteria used to divide in the system into models. So it's not just having the models that's the thing, it's how, how you create them. How are they? How are they? They are, are established. And this, in this paper, in, in, in this uh, paper, it's very it's quite quite technical, but it's readable. But, uh, but he says there that instead of doing a functional decomposition, decomposition that we have a workflow. You said that's a service and that's a service and that's a service. You must do it differently. And he suggests information hiding as the concept he uses. So that. If you can find out what changes in a component together and what, um, what chain can change without having effect in the others, that's how you sort of split it up. But it's completely different from what people used to do back then. Yeah. So why, are we wanna, why do we want to do this microservice thing it, to begin with? All modulation, the old, the old type. And I see it, uh, when I did this talk in 2016, it was more about the development speed. Uh, and I felt that that didn't go well with Agile. It doesn't feel like it's a feature factory kind of thing. Get to get code out quickly. And it is, kind of is, but it's more about reducing um, uh, dependence between components and teams. That's the important part here. You want to reduce the coordination between those teams that make those services. They shouldn't share services, for example. And you could say that, is, could this be actually a prerequisite for Agile? I must admit I'm quite fond of Agile and do a lot of work on Agile actually on these days, trying to not getting into the coaching bit, but similar. And I think b having microservices is one of those important architecture things that you need to get in place to get proper Agile teams. As Alan Hulop said, you can't be Agile if you're finding your architecture. And I agree with that. But also, in, in, in addition to this, there are also other good things with microservices. You can innovate easily, just create service outside of the rest and just innovate, create new crazy stuff. And you reduce the cognitive load that is easy for you to get going with one service without understanding the whole big monolith like you did before. And it's easier to onboard for people, and unfortunately, also easier to outsource. 
some may like that, some may, some no, don't. And of course, also the, the technical part, by scalability and all. But I want to start off with saying what Microsoft is not. And I nicked this from Matthias Farras. I think it's a brilliant illustration. I said that this is the uh, illustration of uh, the diagram of two microservices and their shared database. <laughs> this is what this is. And I see a lot of this. You, we create services, and we did that back in the SOA one days as well, creating a lot of sterile services on top of something that is shared. Ship chunky, big database, usually. So it's not that, right? Those are at best functions. They're probably just CRUD services. They're, they're, they're not, uh, I don't define those as microservices. And another one, which is uh, more contentious probably, is that it's not entities. You could go in this direction, but you end up quickly understanding seeing that, uh oh, everything is tied together then if you do that. It's actually been established as an anti pattern basically doing that. I've done it, so it's a deep learning for me. And uh, this is from a telecom domain, by the way, and we saw that we saw subscription everywhere. Okay, let's define subscription seems important. It seems like something that the domain cares about. Let's define that. And it was it was used everywhere. It got the god object. It became the god object. So yeah, and this is also quite familiar for the old people in the, in the audience. This is from 2008. Bill Poole has a brilliant set of uh, blog posts from 2008. Recommend to read it if you're into SOA or want to learn more about that type of SOA. This is the sort of the antithesis. We have a layered architecture with services that are dependent on each other. I was, and I mean, when when the Microsoft arrived, I think. Ooh, hopefully, I hope we don't get into that situation again. That we learn something from the history and blog posts like this. But doesn't it look quite similar? This this is from Uber again, I think. Hacking on Uber today seems like, but it's not. There's a lot of dependencies there, right? That red service has a lot of dependencies to be able to deliver its its, its service. It's not independent. It's not definitely not autonomous. So, and I've seen presentation from Netflix they have oh, actually the same and it's find it quite interesting that Netflix is always often used as a as an example of how to do microservices I'm not sure if you want to Netflix is Netflix they are special you're probably not Netflix so I'm afraid we're gonna I don't think we're gonna end up here but uh, we might you're gonna get some time reading that that's a good view of how we saw SOA back in the days Way back to the big, huge ESP that everybody talked about and everybody needed. And there was somebody who was golfing with some important people, and yeah, we bought these humongous ESPs. I'm not saying that we are moving in that direction now, hopefully not, because as I said, it's more of a grassroots movement. But we are still talk. I've seen API gateways, they get a lot of logic in it, they're very central, they get the bottleneck for, for teams. And you got even people are talking about Microsoft's ESPs. I mean, I get ooh, shivers, but. But thank God that there's a, and there are some there are some good sites as well. You got Larcom and you got uh, uh, Kubernetes. This is good for this, but and they are more of a technical level. So I don't see that those as an ESP necessarily. But but service meshes could become one. So let's get back to this because, <coughs> as I said, microservice is not necessarily well defined. So some people see microservice as I just lack of better just use the. Mu here for that. That's the James Lewis thinking type of services. They are not very small, but they are at least somewhat sizable. And you've got these nano services, as I would call them. And also, like uh, like the old, um, there is a SOA pattern book. They also refers to these as nano services. They are too small. They're really independent to each other. And then you can risk of getting to this situation which for me looks like a lot of people has gotten themselves into. You got the whole model still, everything is the, the same thing. There's a, they're large, there's a large system, highly coupled. There's low cohesion, as I said, at one component can be, of course, but have low cohesion, but the whole system has a high cohesion, uh, that's a low cohesion, sorry. And so you sort of create the monolith and just add it in a, a network in between. And you got all these lovely fallacies of distributed uh, uh, computing. So um, this is also a slide that I had back in 2016, and I, was, I wasn't alone being worried. This is Kelly Summers. She saw a business opportunity here. 
I'm not sure if you, any of you have been in a situation, hired in and said, well, we need help. The marks just everywhere. But other people saw this, like Steve Jones, Judy DeHaan saw this, Clement Vastas, got well of it. Uh, a lot of people. So I'm, I wasn't alone. So let me do a little bit of a dive into what services really are, micro or not. And for me, it, it, the central thing is actually you're doing service orientation. That's what you're doing. And since, again, since it's a .NET, you probably know Don Box, VCF guru. He created something called Tenet of Service Orientation. They're not bad. They're, still, they're okay. They're a bit dated, but they're not bad. Boundaries are explicit. He says they should be, and kind of makes sense from those days where you had Corba and distributed objects, and you never knew if you, your call was going to the to the to the to a process within your server or some other side of the world. You didn't know. So this is making that jump explicit. Autonomy again. And he also added a few others which are probably a bit outdated now, but still, you shouldn't share types, you should share schemas, schemas and, and, and contracts. And service capabilities based on policies. I think these are still surprisingly valid, apart from probably the last two. We probably solved those, basically. But especially the second one. I think we failed a lot on that. And remember, this, this was back in 2004, I believe. And I, I, as, as far as I remember, so back then, uh, it was a lot of focus on reuse. You should, if you create a service, you should create, it should be reused. If not, it's not, uh, you don't get all you want from them. So they should be, they should be, uh, yeah, they should be reused. But it's nothing about reuse here. And I, I really like this drawing for some reason, just to show you what the service, what's new with our service. A lot of people ended up talking, seeing services as just APIs or interfaces, but they are not. There's something more to them. This is our sort of evolution uh, from the back in the day to, to what services are. You started in the early days when when you, when you wrote functions, well, imperative, and then you moved into components, creating more cross-grained, and then services are something really different. They are they contain all the other stuff, but they also contain data, which is really important. And in this drawing, they, in, they insisted that they should use events for interfaces. So they are, they're not, they, as, as you did a hundred said, they don't serve, they just are. Sounds fluffy, but it kind of makes sense. So, okay, this is servitization, modularization. What can this do for us? Kandinsky, by the way, this. Domain driven design. Kind of kicked off the whole thing was this blue book. Still surprisingly relevant book. I still go back to it time and time and again and find new knowledge in it that I missed the first time I read it. And remember, as me, probably as many of the other ones have tried to read it, you don't read the full book first time. You stop about halfway through until you get to do the fluffy stuff and then ooh, and then you start coding and then you have written, all, written your whole code base based on those tactical patterns and ignore all the essential stuff that's later on. But for me, uh, after doing the main design for about 15 years now, it's, it's not really about the patterns. They, they call them patterns, but patterns is a bit tricky word. Because you, you see patterns, you just go and f copy and follow the recipe and you're done. But it's more of a set of heuristic for me. The sort of principles, the guiding guidelines, there's, there's more of a, which makes it a bit more fluffy, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is, it's way more than those patterns, if you like. It's a way of learning. Yeah. There's a reason why it's called domain driven design, by the way. Yeah. Your domain should drive your you should it should reflect the business, that's the thing. So uh, this is this uh, this is uh, this is a summary of domain driven design. I'm not sure which, where this is from. I think it was the uh, domain driven design reference uh, free book that that's on InfoQ. But uh, so this is a three point summary of of, of uh, essence of domain driven design. So it's the, col the collaboration between the, soft the software uh, engineers or software developers and the business or the domain experts. So this is, this is also back to what some of the SOA uh, experts tried to, to, to communicate, is the IT's, uh, IT business alignment. So this, this is all aligned with that. So it's a shared un an understanding between these parties. And also you, should, you shouldn't necessarily do this all over the place. My first attempt, we did that everywhere. Domain driven design, tactical patterns everywhere. Not necessarily worth the effort. You should focus on the core domain, where it really matters. 
And core domain with that, I mean, what part of the business, uh, what part of, of, of your company is really central to, 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 to their, their workings? What is it that makes them different from others? What's the competitive advantage, so to speak? And also this tricky term, ubiquitous language, which generally means that when these people work together, they should create their, they should together be um, define language so that they speak the same language. But the language shouldn't be generic, it shouldn't be everywhere. It should be within that bounded context. And we're gonna get into that, what that bounded context is, but just, yeah, for now, let's leave it at that. So, let's open up the toolbox. This is the whole list. And of course, I'm gonna use the rest of the talk to go through every one of them in detail. Because that you, that's what you do when you have a pattern build, right? You implement everything. The more you have, the better it is. Mm. No, that's not how this works. You take learning from all of them, keep them in mind, and, imply, and uh, employ the ones that you find useful in your situation. And I really love the strategic part, which is these. And the bigger they are, the more important they are. Can you kind of so here you have the bound of context again. You have a core domain, which I mentioned earlier, and the, and the ubiquitous language. Right? These are the central parts to the manual design. So let's, how you, would you use this? And I'm Nick, this one from uh, Nick Tune, I believe, from his book, yeah. So you have, uh, as I said, you have, this, uh, you, have the, you have a problem domain, and the business want to do some changes to it. So the domain expert and developer team sit together and sort of figure this out. What do we have and what do we want? And doing that, they create this ubiquitous language together. Right. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that, you, that the business has all the rights to define those terms. It should be defined together. Because developers have a lot, lot of good input when it comes to terms. Maybe even the system matter expert actually is a developer that's been around, uh, yeah, been, been around for ages. So it's a collaboration. And with that language, they start to dig into the domain. Of course, they do this in, in an iterative way, of course. And with this domain knowledge, it's described in that language. And then, sorry, the clicker doesn't seem to work anymore. Then you start modeling. First, you say, okay, let's find out what sort of are these domains that we talked about earlier, and what is the core domain, and what is the, the supporting domain, or what's the generic domain. And these, these type of terms are just saying, how important are these domains to the business? Right? So as I said earlier, focus on a core domain. And then you start modeling and sort of create ideas how you can solve this for every, every uh, domain. And here we are into this bounded context. Those models within those own domains, they are within that bounded context. They should be, uh, that model is only, only valid in within that context for that subdomain. And a way of finding these domains. Uh, some people of you, some of you might, may, may know that I have some talks on what, what, what is called business capabilities. And this is one way to find those domains without, like, without necessarily having that discussion, as I said, with drilling on language, but you can just look at the business. What do the business do? What are the, this is a top level uh, map where we have the enterprise. It has some management stuff, corporate management, has some oversight. But then it does product development, it does delivery, it does uh, support and services and market development. Those could be domains, right? At least uh, somewhere to start. And you can break this down further. You can say the market development that is also uh, uh, constructed by different uh, capabilities. And you can break this down further on three or four levels or something like that. So it depends on where you are. Your domain is where, you, where you're at. Where, where do you work? What sort of support, business support are you uh, providing? So let's look into these subdomains and, why and how you can use language to find those barriers and what that could look like. So I'm just nicking those uh, here from the other, let me see, the capabilities. You see, our, we have some, something about subscription management, something. We have some billing and we have some customer care. So within Subscription management, you probably have an owner of a subscription. This is from telecom domain, by the way. So you have a subscription which has an owner, but that owner, in the billing domain, it wouldn't be an owner anymore, necessarily. It would be a payer. So it's the same, same entity, same thing, but different names. 
in customer care, it could actually just be the customer. But it, I actually had a long discussion at the company we were at, and we couldn't find a customer anywhere, <laughs> like explicit. The only way, the only place we found was in BI. That's why they were really interested in customers. Customer care are usually just interested in, interested in tickets and stuff like that. So, yeah. And uh, another example, portfolio. There have uh, a portfolio of subscriptions. In billing, that could be your billing account. That's how you bill. That's the level you bill at. And customer care could be your install base. That's the products that the, 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 um, the customer has. And another one, subscription. In billing, that could be sales invoice. And in customer care, that could be products. So you see, different names, but different contexts, or different domains. So this is one way. This is sort of the uh, classical domain-driven design way to find like, these domains. See where does the terms change names? Where do they behave differently? But, and, and, and these models. And we all, as we all know this quote probably, that all models, uh, there, there, there's no one perfect model. Models are not perfect. They are, by design, uh, wrong. Because that's why we do modeling. If not, we wouldn't do it. We just do the real thing. And within each of these domains, uh, you would create a model that's perfect, or as a fit for that, a good enough fit for that domain. That doesn't mean there is a model across all these domains. That wouldn't, that's not what domain driven design says. So again, within that bound context. This one I nicked from uh, uh, Von Vernon's book. Yeah, I can believe he spoke here yesterday. And here you have a, a list of domains. Again, I just used, used these uh, types, the core domain, supporting, and generic. How would, uh, how would the bounded context fit here? Ideally, you want bounded context to be one-to-one -one with, the, with the domain. But very often, more often than not, they're not. If you come from a monolith, for example, then you have a, have a bound in the context that crosses many domains, maybe even all, if you're a really big one. And here, in this example, you see he has, he has taken care to create those bound context within the core and the supporting domains. Use the effort there. Um, I can also mention that uh, when microservices broke, a lot of the, uh, the, the DDD people was finally saying, at last we have some enforcement for, to enforcing those uh, boundaries, the boundary context. I, I believe Evan said that, at last some boundaries. Physical boundaries. All right, let's go back to this. How would you do this in a domain driven design come out thinking then? Maybe something like this. Don't look at the names because they, this is just an illustration, so they are probably not going to fit. But uh, yeah, you could. So a microservice. If these were microservices, a, a domain, a bounded concept, would be just a, a grouping of services. As Evan said, it's a cluster of co-designed services. So how you break up that domain into components? You can break it up as much as you want, but they are built together. They are maintained together within that context or that domain. And the good thing is when uh, the sort of the cool thing is then when we do when we do this is that you can you can have different rules from within the domain and across across them, north south as I mean between the top layer and the bottom layer you can do synchronous calls no problem commands even uh, whatever you want to do across them you want to be have this loose coupling autonomy or autonomy you can do events for example right? you want you want different rules for different uh, situations east west available they call that. Huh? And also, I illustrated where you can draw the, the, make the drawing all the way to the top, which here is uh, actually an application, but it uh, could be a UI. There's been an, a few talks here about comp UI composition on micro frontends. This is an example of that. Where you, the service uh, actually goes all the way out to the UI, composed. And uh, well, another cool thing that just came to me the other day is that uh, events then is actually a good enabling constraint. Because say, if you, if, if you enforce events between them, one thing is that you, you get this loose coupling, but also it changes the way you think about design, because then you wouldn't be you you wouldn't have you you would have to remove that sort of um, what's called behavior coupling that you need something for somebody else. You can't do that anymore at events, because then you're just communicating what what has happened. That is the, the definition of an event. It's just a fact that you'd share with others. Yes, uh, I'm gonna dig a little bit into one pattern from the tactical part, sorry. And that is the aggregate, which is quite interesting. Uh, it took me a long time to understand what the aggregate was, and probably hasn't figured 
100% out yet, but I'm still contemplating it. But for me, it's um, we used it back then as a pattern. As a, we have actually classes called aggregates and all that, you know, building aggregate rules and the whole thing. But for me, uh, now it's more of a way of thinking again. It is an aggregate, sample of it here, again from the telecom domain. An aggregate is a way of enforcing rules, business rules, invariants. And by doing that, that means that it's not a static thing. It's you have one for every use case. It is a command handler, if you like. Like there's some there's some interaction that comes in, and the aggregates protects those in invariants and business rules. And as, and uh, and uh, and um, uh, and in that picture, they don't control the. Um, they control the change. They are not the change themselves. The change is actually the event or the, the, the results of what is happening within that aggregate. But the cool thing is, aggregates, one of the definitions is that they should have the uh, transactional boundary, which means you probably shouldn't make anything smaller than an aggregate, because then you've got cross uh, transaction across components in a microservice as well. So they should, that's probably the lower end. That's why I think that the tiny, tiny, tiny Fred George type of uh, nano services are probably not uh, a good choice, at least everywhere. An example of, uh, of how you can, this aggregate can work. I'm not saying this aggregate is good because I think I would probably rewritten it if I did it again now. But you have an aggregate and there's a portfolio and you add a new subscription and you see that this is the same subscription that you had before. Is there, can you add that then? Is, that's the rule, maybe. Maybe you couldn't. Maybe you can't. You can't have duplicates, for example. Yeah. That's how that would work. So I think there is a there is a taxonomy, kinda here. At the big end, we we don't have the monolith because we're into services here. You have the big services, more this SOA 2.0 type of services I showed earlier, which is actually the whole domain about the context could be one service, or it could be more of a uh, See, uh, a part of that service that is self-contained. I mean, I think it is Stefan Tilkov who has this, this definition called self-contained services, which are by definition smaller than the big domain. They are part of a, uh, say it's a web page that you're gonna create or something. And on the other end, you have the aggregates, as I see. That's the smallest part. So for me, it's, it is a taxonomy here that it is, the services should be, it would be as large as a subdomain and not smaller than an aggregate. That's how I think it. I tend to fall a little bit in between here. I think the, the subdomain will not be too large. You want to have more uh, flexibility in your, in your architecture. So how would you go about splitting? You normally, we create the, when we uh, break a monolith, we, as this illustration uh, says, they should one byte at a time. That's normally what we do. I've done that. I have a big monolith. Oh, let's take the low hanging fruit. Let's take the obvious stuff out first. Oh, that was easy. Okay, how do you go from here? And it seems like a lot of people just hack away. And I think we should have a, a more of a strategy here, because we risk up ending up in something like, I'd really like to illustrate it like this. You just break it completely into small pieces, and it's, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't even look good, it doesn't make sense, it's sharp, it c you can cut yourself. And, uh, it's, it's terrible. So, uh, and I think, as I said earlier, that when people start hacking away, it's so it seems like a little, there's a mob mentality going on there. People can just go ahead and break stuff as they want. And it's a slippery slope, because when you start doing those small pieces first, it seems easy, and then you get going, and, and before you know it, there's a lot of teams doing the same, and suddenly you have hundreds and thousands of microservices, and you're in a rut. I see people, I see companies doing this, and it's, uh, they come calling and uh, can you help us with the main range sign? We heard that could help us in here and all that. And I, I think I actually think <laughs> for all the good things that containers and serverless gives us, it is also a huge opportunity to end up with something like this. People just hacking away because it's easy. I picture something like this, just following the analogy, an analogy of glass, that you should have. As I said earlier, I don't necessarily say that you should have a plan, but you have at least some strategy of how you should break things apart. Have a map of some kind. Have an idea how this should look in the end. What sort of domains do you have? How many, what sort of services are you, are you envisioning having in the end when you've finished with this? Because what we're doing, and essentially doing it, we are creating 
what some people refer to as social technical systems, because we are not all these are not necessarily just technical stuff. They are involving people and teams. And if somebody creates one service over here and that doesn't that conflicts with another one, team gets into uh, problems and issues. So I, I suggest that you try to find out what your end goal is. How should they look? Have a map. And be guided by domain driven design, for example, or SOA or capabilities or whatever you like, but have some up front. I also want to bring some attention to this. You probably read this post by uh, Martin Fowler. He said you have to be this tall to start doing microservices. And I know, uh, I've laughed at it. I'm sure a lot of you have laughed at it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why bother? <laughs> but uh, there is something to this. And um, what he says that you need, those four icons, they are rapid provisioning, basic monitoring, rapid application development, and, 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 and you could say, that, okay, that's your opinion, man. I, I don't care, just hack away, D get going. But we got some data on this now. It's the obligatory accelerate reference. That book is, uh, is absolutely a gem of a book. Here you see a low performers, I had this number of developers there, and not necessarily number of services, but I, that could align. And uh, what the uh, deploy frequency is. For low performers, they degrade when they scale. Medium, flat, but you see the curve on the top. So I think there is something to what Fowler said here. You should probably have some ideas how to do the, all this stuff before you get going with the Microsoft split. You don't want to have end up in the gray line, gray line there, degrading. So I want to actually I'm going to end early here now. It's like, but what we're doing is we are creating complex systems, and this is a I love this quote from John Gall: "A complex system that works is invariably found to evolve from something simple." And if you try to create a complex system, it's going to fail, and you have to go back and start simply. Again. So, by doing, by, by, by sort of having, uh, I would suggest that say if you have a big monolith and you break it up, break it up into big pieces, maybe even start with a modular, modularization only, and don't break it out as Microsoft at all. Just start modularizing and, and use big components, like for example those uh, domains, and then start doing the splitting for stuff that you see that is really, that you need to. There's a there's a sort of a to be reduced, uh, sort of businessy term, but there's a return of investment for doing that service. So, do, uh, so to summarize, start simple, from the start from where you are. Um, you can experiment, but have that whole picture. Have them try to find, create that map as I mentioned earlier. Do use, use business capabilities, use domains, domain domain design, find, find out what your domains are, start understanding the business deeply, because that is what doing domain domain design gives us, techniques for doing that, or heuristics. And if you don't have that, I would suggest that you start with that monolith, or a modular one, preferably. And remember, Microsofts are not for all, because it's hip and everybody does it, doesn't mean that you should. Your legacy system and your big monolith might just be just fine from where you are. Do you have any data saying that your monolith is actually stopping you or preventing you? It has served you well, probably. Or as Stefan Tilkov said, says, said I love that quote, successful system sucks. Right? So don't throw that legacy data and legacy system out with, uh, with uh, and uh, throwing the baby out with, uh, with, with the bath with, uh, in, uh, with the bathwater. So take care. Right, that was uh, my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> if you have any questions, that can be found on Twitter. And uh, also a small shout out to Domain Driven Sign Norway. Uh, where you can meet me frequently. There's a meetup. Come and join us. Thank you.